Let me make sure I record right this time. I'll do an introduction. Don't worry. What's up, guys? I'm Zap, community lead at the Entrepreneur Center. So sorry for being flustered this morning. Uh, you know me, though. We're always running around making things happen here. Right now, that's in this virtual world. Really excited to have the Polar Notion team and everyone kind of talk to us about a different sort of topic, uh, talking more tech-oriented, talking to developers. Just as a little update, I do believe next month in July, we're going to be hosting little hybrid events, so stuff that's virtual and in person, just having options available. So stay tuned for that. Otherwise, uh, I'll hand it off. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you everyone for, for tuning in. Um, I am excited to be here today and we uh, are, have definitely come together to talk about communicating with developers, but really my goal is to make sure that you get out of this conversation uh, what you would hope. So uh, we'll really start to kick things off in just a minute with uh, hearing from you and you sharing what success looks like for you during our time together. Um, I just to give you kind of a, an understanding of what I've got set up over here. If it looks like my eyes are bouncing everywhere, I have a notepad down here that I'm taking notes on to make sure that I cover the topics that you find interesting. And then I will be running a presentation so you can uh, see a couple of slides. Uh, I'm not a big paragraph on a slide person. So if uh, you are hoping that you're going to be able to read lots of content here. This is not that kind of place. So uh, I'm going to kick things off. And if at any point my audio cuts out or you can't hear me, feel free to let me know. Awesome. Everyone, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to try and keep. All right, so the title of the talk obviously is how to communicate with developers, uh, how to talk to software engineers. There's a lot of different ways of saying it, but at the end of the day, the way I like to think about it is it's really about the art of talking to people who talk to computers. And uh, who are you and why the heck are you somebody who can uh, communicate this? Well, I started Polar Notion back in 2012. And since the beginning, our focus has really been on human-centered software. And, you know, human-centered, what does that actually mean? Well, in the technology space, it's really, really uh, compelling or just kind of common to start to drift more toward being like a computer than it is being like a human. And for us, we believe in uh, technology that serves humanity, not the other way around. So human-centered technology is a really big focus of ours. And yes, that is my actual email. If you have any questions or thoughts, uh, both during the call or after, feel free to reach out. This is the interactive portion, uh, both we will start and end here. And I would love to hear from each of you what success looks like uh, as we go through these next couple steps. So kick things off. Um, it doesn't have to be super crazy, right? If you're like, man, I'm just looking to kill an hour. Awesome. I can help you there. Uh, or maybe you are starting a new job coming up, talking with developers. Very cool. Uh, let me know. Uh, I can go first. I'm an EC noob. Um, two years out of school. Actually, Dan Berger, also on the call, was my mentor in college. Um, I am looking to build my first ever really like full-time uh, startup app. I'm actually, like I said, I was a, I'm, I've been a developer professionally for two years. Um, I'm looking to figure out how to teach non-technical people that I bring on, how to better talk to myself and the technical staff um, that I hopefully one day hire. Cool. Love it. Thanks, Chandler. I mean, I'll go. Hi. I'm, a, I'm Debbie Garcia. I'm actually not a developer at all, but I am starting... Um, a, a, a platform, a SaaS platform for the hospitality industry. And my hurdles have been while I've been interviewing developers is I'm a very visual person. So I did build kind of on Wix, my own click through prototype and being like, can you do this, but make it way more professional and work on the back end. But I think my struggles have been really getting accurate pricing based on I'm bootstrapping this. So talking to developers and using the lingo that they understand to get me to the place where I can build my MVP and get to the next phase so I can start selling um, is kind of like where I need to be. So any help there on getting through phases with the right lingo? 
Awesome. So you are bootstrapping a product, the SaaS platform for hospitality, and you're looking for uh, really just an understanding, but also working through some challenges around pricing and building an MVP. Love yeah. it. <laughs> Who else? For those just jumping in, we are taking a second to share a little bit about what success looks like for us uh, during the remainder of our time together. I'll go for the EC. Next month, we have Dandy Hacks, a hacker group building a whole online uh, platform for me. And they're doing like a whole competition around it. And I am trying to create like a product roadmap. And I've never done that before. And sometimes I feel like they ask questions and I answer in really dumb ways. So trying to just not look absolutely clueless to a whole group of hackers is my goal. Cool. Awesome. So maybe speaking the lingo a little bit. Totally. Awesome. Yeah. We'll also, we'll, we'll very briefly cover jargon. I think that's uh, one thing that tech has a lot of, and then uh, we can get caught up in understanding some of those terms for sure. So two more people. So for me, I, I take this from the opposite end. So I'm a developer and I'm looking to how do I communicate with my uh, non-developer colleagues? I'll jump in. Uh, I'm a lawyer and software developer. And so I'm interested in building startup apps. And I'm also interested in really being able to communicate between legal teams, business teams and, and software development teams. So that's sort of what success looks like for me is just better nailing down how to, uh, how to communicate between these different teams. Love it. Uh, one perspective, or I guess two perspectives that I, uh, I hope will be valuable today. I really come from two worlds. So uh, most of my professional career has been on the service side. So running an agency, building lots and lots of uh, software for uh, typically very non-technical teams, early stage, first time founders, those kind of things. Uh, and in 2016, I actually, uh, alongside doing that, joined a group called New Story. So New Story is pioneering solutions to end global homelessness. And I joined as their CTO. And really from there started to get a lot more experience being on a product team. So kind of walking in both worlds, that's a pretty common distinction uh, that I like to see when people are looking to pursue a career in tech is getting an understanding of where they, what side of the equation they wanna live on. Are they providing services to others or are they within a team um, kind of in the, the day to day. And uh, those are two perspectives that I've been able to develop over the years, both leading teams, writing software in that context, and then growing businesses around them. So uh, if, if kind of understanding one side of the equation or the other is valuable to you, then please feel free to speak up. And I hope to bring that perspective to the table as well. Awesome. One last person, anybody else? What does success look like for you during the next 50 minutes? All right, we'll dive in. Let me share my screen again. Let's make sure I'm sharing the correct screen. All right, how's that? Everybody good? Awesome. Okay, so talk through success. We've got um, plenty of things around understanding terminology. We've got uh, communication between technical, non-technical, um, and then definitely a hefty dose of, I'm building something myself and want to be able to survive that journey or make it less painful. I want to now turn back the floor over to you. And uh, I'd love to just hear some, I don't know if it's thoughts, ideas, words, phrases, but what comes to mind when you think of a developer or you hear the, uh, the phrase developer, software engineer? Uh, what are some things that comes, come to mind? Feel free to just throw them out. I'll start. Arrogant. Cool. Now you. Money. Nerdy. Lazy nerdy? in a good way. Let's see. She said nerdy. Nerdy. Got it. Okay. Maybe dirty every now and then. I would say capable. Intelligent. Intelligent. 
these creative. Like the, creative. These are like the kindest words I've ever heard. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that I'm a software engineer first and then heard what you said. I know you started with arrogant and then I thought every bad word possible. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, what are the what are the things that you might not feel comfortable uh, rattling off to uh, to someone like me? But you're probably thinking. Let's get to that. Introvert. Introvert. All right. Awkward. Awkward. Here we go. Boring. Like socially difficult. Socially difficult. Misaligned. Myopic. Boring. Boring. Easy, easy. Hey, careful. Yeah, I think somebody said boring like two or three times. No, uh, that's great. Um, I think part of why this exercise can be really helpful is because, um, and this is true about all communication, but obviously we're talking about this context today with developers. Um, that I think it's helpful in all relationships to recognize that we bring our own uh, preconceived notions to the table right? Simply by having a title or an understanding of what somebody else might do, we have assumptions baked into to that relationship. And why speaking them out can be really valuable is because first of all, in a setting like this, you realize you're not the only one thinking it, which is great. So cool. You're not crazy. Uh, but then also labeling things in psychology is actually a great way of starting to be able to unpack it and really understand what does that mean? Uh, for us, we have a term or a, a, an idea that we like to talk about, which is uh, a macchiato moment. So if, how many coffee drinkers do we have in the group? Anybody coffee drinkers? I mean, for sure. Yeah. So there are uh, typically two types of coffee drinkers. You have the specialty bougie yuppie coffee drinker. Uh, I am one of them, right? So I like uh, very freshly roasted, lighter roast coffee, usually some crazy brewing technique, uh, specialty coffee drinkers. And then you have your Starbucks drinkers uh, who, uh, or Dunkin' Donuts, if you will, right? More commercial coffee and oftentimes will, you know, like lots of cream and sugar and all the special things that uh, make everything in life yummy. Uh, so those two groups, specialty and more um, commercial coffee drinkers. And if you were to go to a Starbucks and order a macchiato, you're going to get uh, about 12 ounces of milk with a little bit of espresso and lots of sugary good syrup, right? And if you went to a specialty coffee shop and ordered a macchiato, the same word, uh, you would get a three ounce drink that's mostly espresso and a little bit of foam at the top, right? So same word, very different uh, definitions, right? And so when my uh, Dunkin' Donuts drinking mother comes with me to a specialty coffee shop, uh, she orders a macchiato. And at this point, I know enough to, uh, to stop her. But uh, when the drink is slid across the counter, she looks at this shot and is thinking, where the heck is my drink? And I paid $7 for that, right? And then on the flip side, if a uh, specialty drinker goes to a Starbucks and they order their macchiato, they're like, wait, why am I getting a glass of warm milk? And what's all of this sweet stuff on here, right? So same word, very different meanings. Uh, and a lot of times um, vocabulary, in, in this case, developer, uh, has lots of different meanings, it means different things to different people. Some have very positive connotations. Some have less than positive connotations. And we bring those things into the conversation with us. And so I think there's no better way of kicking things off than really starting to uh, if we can't define terms, right? I don't think we have enough time to try and uh, really define this. We can at least recognize that we have different thoughts and opinions about what this word uh, actually means. Now, I have a warning or disclaimer as we start. Developers are humans, right? They're just humans. Uh, and while they may be a unique breed, they're still just people. And uh, people tend to uh, be inspired or prompted by incentives and they tend to want to be treated with respect and all of these uh, kind of basic principles like we talk about with any relationship uh, are still true with developers it can be misconstrued sometimes because they can feel cold they can feel detached socially difficult was a word that was used right because all of these things can describe developers it can uh to confuse them with the computers that they talk to um, is, is pretty common, uh, but we don't want to miss the fact that like, no, they still have emotions and they are still people. Um, so big disclaimer over all of this, that uh, developers are people too. And then uh, another warning here, a lot of what we're going to talk about are generalizations, right? Uh, they're not super specific to any one person or place. Um, 
generalizations are bad, but sometimes they can be useful. And today, uh, even as we shared, right, a lot of your mention of a developer, uh, some of them had a very negative bent. And I don't think that's good or bad. It just kind of is. And so we're going to take your understanding of developer and try and use that today to inform some uh, a better understanding. Now, as we start, one thing that I have found to be true with working with developers is uh, it's better to give them the problem than the solution. Part of why I bring this up is because oftentimes, and I, I do this, um, teams that I've worked with, this is a pretty common uh, thing. I even, uh, Debbie, as you mentioned, you have a Wix site, right? You've designed something here. And uh, it, it's pretty common to go to somebody else, whether it's they're on your team or maybe you're contracting them and you're like, hey, I solved the problem, here it is, just go do this, right? Uh, but oftentimes for computer programmers, software engineers, the reason they got into this isn't just because they like typing on their keyboard, it's because they like to solve problems. And problems with technology are awesome because uh, they're cheap and they're endless, right? I could spend hours and hours and hours, not spend a dollar and never get to the bottom of a really tough problem. And that mindset of enjoying good problems often conflicts with the, here's my solution, go build it perspective, right? Uh, so rather than pitching them your idea, show them the problem, help them understand the problem. And then oftentimes uh, you're uh, enrolling them into the problem solving uh, part of the equation, which is what they like. If you show up, say, hey, here's a solution. I need you to go build it. You've kind of sucked the fun out of it, right? It's like, hey, I've got this great movie. Here's the punchline and the ending. Enjoy. Now all you have left to do is watch this thing that you know how it ends. That's not really enjoyable. And so remembering uh, kind of the, the spirit of the engineer is how I would describe it, that at, at the core, it's really just problem solving with computers. And if you present the the solution rather than helping them see the problem and then allowing them or inviting them into the conversation right from the get-go. There is natural tension that starts to emerge. Uh, for the developers in the crowd, does that sound about right? For those that have done this before, yes. Get yep, some head it, nods. Yep. It's spot on. Yeah, cool. Um, Next, this is something that a mentor of mine shared uh, many, many years ago. I don't know if it's stuck because it's kind of math, mathy, but uh, the idea that expectation minus communication equals frustration. And so when you have two people who come together on any level, it just so happens here, it tends to emerge around uh, technical and non-technical teams. Uh, if expectations aren't communicated, that is usually where frustration emerges, right? Uh, so it's not necessarily that one group is dumb and one is smart or one has all the answers and one is ignorant. It, it usually comes from the fact that when I have my expectation of things, and if I don't communicate them to you on either side of the equation, that's where uh, frustration and friction really start to come from. And so uh, what I love about that equation is you can also work backwards, right? If you are feeling frustration in a relationship or in a dynamic, come back and say, okay, well, what expectations do I have of this situation that I probably haven't communicated yet, right? Uh, more often than not, uh, there's usually a, a, a delta or a gap there of some uncommunicated expectation. And it's not to say that it's always going to work out perfectly, or in many cases, we kind of recognize it too late and we're like, ah, crap, we can't just uh, talk about it and it's all going to get better. We have real problems to fix, but it can start to create a model that we can work from and then improve things going forward. Now, why is it so hard, right? So we talked about, this is really about humans, it's about communication, it's about expectation setting. Um, but what's unique in a normal conversation is you have two people who are talking with one another and exchanging ideas, but there's a, an added complexity here, which I would contribute to uh, more translations. So why is it hard for non-technical teams to talk to technical teams or non-technical people to talk to technical people? Um, I've tried to like map out the, the flow of conversation, right? So you have what you say, so what you tell them, and then what they heard you say, right? This, which is informed based on their perspective, their understanding, and then what they have to then go and try and tell the computer. And then there's what the computer interprets based on what they entered, right? Because that's not a, a perfect science either. And then there's what the computer does with that information. So when uh, I was uh, first married, I spent a lot of free time uh, 
programming. And one Saturday, I remember my wife, she was running around the house doing all kinds of stuff. And I'm working on a problem at the, at the computer. And I'm very frustrated. This was early in my career. It felt like every line of code I wrote, I was like one step forward, two steps back. And I'm racking my brain for like three hours only to realize that I had added a comma where it didn't belong. Okay. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, you didn't do something. It's like, actually I did a little too much and the computer like vomited all over me for hours and I couldn't figure it out. Finally, what solved it was going literally line by line and being like, what is wrong with this? What is wrong with this? Can I delete it? Can I add it? And then finally realized one comma is what created the problem. And I'm the one who's supposed to be able to talk to computers. Right. And so how much, uh, if, if it can happen, with like that simply, how much more opportunity is there for things to get missed between all this back and forth? And so I think it's uh, helpful at these moments to step back and realize the reason it's hard sometimes is just because it's hard. Like there's a lot of complexity in the chain of communication and it's okay. It's okay to say, hey, the work that we're doing is difficult. And so if we experience frustration or challenges, that's a natural part of the process. And in so much of life, we feel like if it's hard, we're doing something wrong. But so much of this just by definition is hard and it's okay to, to be that way. Um, and so, yeah, in this, you have lots of different points of translation um, between many different parties. And one of them isn't even human, right? If was like 80 to 90% of human uh, of communication is nonverbal. And then we're expected to talk to these computers and they have none of that, right? Uh, so there's already a pretty steep barrier to understanding. Okay, now um, many of you are working actively on software projects. And so I thought it would be helpful to stop for a second and talk about why some software projects fail. If you have a team with a mix of skills and backgrounds, you've got engineers, you've got product people, you've got designers, uh, if a project were to fail, for some reason, there's, uh, as, as people, we, we look around the room and, and want to point fingers, right? Uh, I don't know why that is. There's probably some really great cognitive research study on uh, how humans do that. And it probably comes back to the fact that we're like, we want to just survive and stay alive and we don't want it to be our issue. Uh, but there's actually a number of reasons that we've seen that projects fail that isn't merely about one person's involvement, right? We want to attribute it to that often, uh, but it's, it's more complicated than that. So software projects tend to fail because uh, there's not a clear owner, right? One person who is accountable and responsible for making decisions and pushing it forward. So that can be huge. So if you have a, a group of three people or 10 people or 20 people, uh, if you don't have someone who is owning it, then it can be doomed. Uh, the next is no deadline, Right? There's a lot of trade-offs that have to happen in the software process. And without a clear understanding of deadlines, uh, that, is a, that is a constraint that helps inform decision-making. Uh, an example that I like to use here is if I had asked you to meet me for coffee in San Francisco next week, there's a lot of ways that you can get to San Francisco in a week. Right? I'm in Atlanta, so that's a, a pretty far point in the U.S., um, well, by this time next week, I could drive a car there, right? It'd take three or four days, but a car is a viable option. An airplane is an option. Uh, these days, you know, Delta's still flying, fortunately, so that's, that's viable. Uh, I could probably hitchhike there, right? That's, that's a viable option. Uh, now, if I adjusted that deadline and I said, you have to meet me for coffee in San Francisco tomorrow, now all of a sudden you've taken most of the decisions off the table, right? The only way most likely that you're going to be able to get to San Francisco by tomorrow is via airplane. And so deadlines aren't just this, uh, or don't have to just be this self-imposed uh, kind of meaningless date. They help inform decision-making and help uh, weigh trade-offs so that you can pick more appropriately based on the desired outcome, right? Uh, so if I were to, let's say, have a very strict budget, then, and I had a week to get to San Francisco, I would choose differently than if uh, I had a day and an unlimited budget. Awesome. So next is unclear expectations. We talked about expectation minus communication. Uh, well, if something that I'm expecting isn't clearly communicated, uh, those things start to compound over time among teams. Next is infrequent, ineffective communication. So you can have frequent communication that is not effective. And then you can also have infrequent communication that is effective. Uh, both of those tend to mix uh, in a pretty, in a pretty bad way. So there's a 
software uh, engineering methodology, if you will, called Agile. Uh, our team uses something called Scrum, which is like a modification of Agile. There's a great book, S Scrum, how to get twice as much done uh, with half the effort or something. And there's not really magic to it other than the fact that it forces frequent, effective communication. So um, they, they have this idea of a daily standup. And early on, um, often young engineers have a problem with the standup because it feels useless, right? If you do it every single day, it's, eventually it starts to feel mundane, uh, not valuable. But one thing that we communicate a lot to uh, software engineers is if you do it daily and treat it like it's important, you'll never get to a spot where you have these big catastrophic uh, derailments of the project because you're, in, you're, you're tweaking uh, the plan along the way where if you don't have consistent communication, then you just wake up and it feels like, oh my gosh, how did this get so far off course, right? Uh, so if it feels tedious and like it's not valuable, it's typically, the value comes from the lack of really big problems uh, over time. Next, and we'll move a little bit quicker through these last few, overly complex. There's mention uh, or a couple mentions of MVP, minimum viable product. Well, minimum is a term much like a macchiato that means different things to different people. My definition of minimum is different than my wife's definition of minimum. When we met, I was more or less living out of my car and crashing on a friend's couch. Right? Everything I owned could fit into an SUV. My wife, also living her minimum life, um, had like furniture and things that for her and her, having her own apartment was required to host people and do things that she wanted. Uh, and so because our definition of minimum is very different, um, projects can tend to develop complexity that may or may not be needed to reach success. So overly complex. Next is too many stakeholders. I personally love three to five person teams. In larger, more corporate settings, there's a lot of software that doesn't launch. And oftentimes it's because they have too many stakeholders. There's too many people who can weigh in on the process. And similar to having no owner, you actually have too many people who are involved and start to tax the decision-making process and the value along the way. Next, unrealistic expectations. For better or for worse, you're not going to be able to create a scratch and sniff app on your phone. Screens don't work that way. They do not emit smells. And uh, while, of course, that is laughable, uh, there are all kinds of unrealistic expectations about what's possible with technology. And when people bring those to the room and they're not communicated, it can create problems. And then finally, this is the, a very big one with all effective teams. So software teams, human teams, sports teams, trust. Google did a massive research study. I believe it was with 10,000 of their teams and they mixed A players and B players and A and B players and C players and all of these different configurations of team. And what they found was trust among team members was actually the, the best indicator of success. All right. Um, the wording here, and there may be plenty of disagreement for sure. Uh, this is how I like to think about it or kind of separate uh, things out when you're thinking about a developer, right? And there's lots of terms and you've even heard me bounce between uh, different synonyms to talk about developers, software engineers, programmers. Um, the way that I like to think about this kind of helps inform um, both decision and conversation. So if you think of it like a pyramid, right? The triangle encompasses everyone who can talk to computers. Uh, at the bottom, which is the largest tier of people, this would be like the tinkerer, the DIYer, um, the way that I think about that is I would call them like a coder or a hacker, right? It in the word implies uh, that yes, they can like do these things. They can swing the hammer. They can talk to the computer. Um, but that tends to be very shallow, right? Just because you can write code doesn't mean you are a sophisticated problem solver or that you even view your work that way, right? There are plenty of people who, can fix bugs and talk to computers on a very basic level, much like how uh, children would communicate, right? My daughter speaks English. I know everything that she's saying, but uh, it's different than um, being able to carry on a, a longer conversation, a more in-depth conversation. So there's a barrier there. Uh, and this is one thing where if you're talking with a developer and having uh, struggles, we see this a lot. If you were to say, hey, um, I've got a tight budget on my project. And so I found somebody 
uh, I'm going to outsource this to another country. And for $10 an hour, uh, I've got, I've got a developer, right? Uh, well, $10 an hour is very cheap. That's not very competitive. Uh, and typically uh, that can be associated with less skilled or people who want to just like, give me a list of things and I'll just punch them out right? Not being as involved in the problem solving process. Next tier up, I would say is like a, a developer, which is somebody who's kind of a mix of both. Like they have the skills to touch and talk to computers. And then also, yeah, you give them a problem and they'll be able to wrangle it to the ground. Right. And for me, like the pinnacle is an engineer. Uh, so when I th think of software engineer, it's not merely somebody who can talk to machines, but who understands the power, the capabilities, the trade-offs, and is actively solving problems, but programming is just the tool that they use, right? That's not the, the greatest value. Their mind is their greatest value, and they are able to, and willing to, um, use many different tools to accomplish the problem. Um, for myself, as I've like, over the years, kind of uh, ascended the pyramid, if you will, um, I found that I actually advocate for writing less code and using other alternatives than just writing code where early on I'm eager, I'm excited. It's like, yeah, let me, let me get at that problem and I'm going to use the hammer that I have to, to knock in the nail. Where as you have more problem-oriented uh, people and kind of more strategic thinking, then you start to see people approach problems very, very differently. So the mindset is ultimately the thing that sets them apart. On the kind of the largest swath of people, they just talk to computers, which is great. They can get stuff done, very, uh, you know, hand them a task list, they'll probably knock it out. And then as you start to move up the pyramid, um, they can like deliver spec. So you can give them more detailed requirements, they can get them done. But really the goal, and as you're thinking about whether it's hiring a programmer or inviting people to kind of higher order thinking, it's really back to solving problems. And that's something that is incredibly valuable and is less of the commoditized side of software development. I heard a mic uh, unmute. Was that a, got any question? No, okay. Uh, next, so here's some do's and again, generalizations here, but by and large, I've found that for myself, this serves me really well leading software engineers and then also um, in helping coach non-technical teams work through some of the challenges. Define the problem, right? and then define success. There's a great author named Brene Brown. She talks about vulnerability and leadership, which is awesome. And I think a very uh, emerging conversation in business. But one thing that she mentions is painting a picture of done, right? A very clear picture. So not just, hey, I want this thing to work, right? Because work is another word that like, yeah, does it turn on or does it accomplish an objective? So being very clear about what success looks like, defining the constraints. If we go back to my mention of a coffee appointment in San Francisco, if I said you've got a week and a thousand dollar budget, right? Those are constraints that help inform the decision making. And in much the same way, if you are bringing a problem to a developer, make sure they understand what the constraints are. On the service side of the work that I've done, I've found that clients often have a hard time being forthcoming about constraints, right? There's a fear that if uh, if I knew the budget of a project, then my goal would be to use it all. And I think that, that fear is, come, is, is honest. It's a very honest fear. Uh, and it comes, it comes about because I think in many cases that can be true, right? Uh, the challenge though, when I think of uh, what it takes to get work done is you have timeline. So how much time do I have to do it? You have features. So what are all the little nuts and bolts that are included in getting it done? And then you have the budget. I make decisions differently depending on what my budget is. And so um, there can often be a tension between uh, like a service, a, an agency and a client uh, for that very reason is oftentimes constraints are deliberately not communicated, which actually doesn't serve the project very well. And that's a hard thing to, uh, to, to unpack together. Um, one way that we've worked to solve it is any budget a client gets us, gives us, we work to cut it. We say, we're going to cut it in half and then we're going to start to work off of that, right? So then they start to feel like, okay, now they're going to pad the number they give us, right? So if they have a $50,000 budget, I already know they're going to tell us 30. It's like, cool. So if I cut that number in half and I'm saying, I'm going to work off of 15, now all of a sudden we're way outside of what their budget was and we have plenty of room to make mistakes, to tweak things, to add over time. 
Um, but constraints are a huge part of, of uh, reaching uh, the end goal successfully. Um, time is also a big one. Uh, for me, time is actually one of the last things I want to compromise on on a project just because time tends to expand to the space you give it. Next, ask what needs clarifying. So it's not a matter of just handing something over, even if it's a problem very well defined. Give them a chance to consume the information and see, hey, uh, is there anything here that's not clear? Right? That ask will prompt a line of thinking, a line of conversation that can be really helpful. Next, what seems most difficult? That's a fair question. Right? If you're handing off a, a problem to solve, hey, what about this uh, is most difficult? The term that we would use for, for the um, kind of the most difficult known unknown, if you will, is a crux. Um, there's a, a friend of mine is from the United States Marine Corps. And he said the crux was like the, the part of the operation that things could get hairy or there were things that they weren't super clear on at the moment. Uh, asking a developer to take a look at the problem and call it out is great. It, in many cases, they're not going to be able to iron that out completely, but recognizing that is very helpful. And I've got a, a scale that I'll share in just a minute that helps also um, create some vocabulary around this idea of difficult. Now, what concerns do you have? So what about what I just gave you is concerning, right? There are some cases where I'm like, hey, I've done that a hundred times, like no concerns. And others like, mm, no, I think I'm good, right? If they hesitate to raise that, they're probably thinking about something. And ideally you create an environment where they feel safe sharing that with you. Next, uh, see what they need from you. So much of a project involves both sides contributing, whether it's information, whether it's skills, whether it's time. And uh, more often than not, there are needs that uh, a developer might have from you, if you're the one handing it to them, right? Uh, that if you can unpack those early, it can be tremendously helpful. Um, we've seen this with like the, the clearest cut example that always comes up is vacation time. Right, so like we're all humans doing our thing and we have jobs and then we say, hey, yeah, I think that's gonna take two weeks, right? Um, sometimes a developer has three days of vacation baked in. Well, it's worthwhile to talk about those early or a client may have a quarterly offsite that they're just out of the office for four days and getting those things out early can be, uh, can be wildly valuable. So these are the constraints that I mentioned. You've got features, timeline, budget, tools. In some cases, maybe there's a specific tool that you have to use. We have, um, if, are any of you familiar with Y Combinator? It's a startup accelerator, uh, very popular in the Bay Area, Dropbox, Airbnb. Um, lots of them have come out of that accelerator. And um, what's awesome about Y Combinator is they have a lot of like commercial benefits. So you get uh, like Stripe credits for credit card processing, Amazon gives you like $100,000 of credit to use, which is incredible. Uh, and I believe we also, uh, New Story had gone through Y Combinator. Uh, Heroku, which is a hosting service, we had credits. And if you're going to build for somebody with $100,000 of Amazon credits, chances are that tool probably has to work on Amazon uh, web services, right? We've finished projects, believe it or not, where you get to the end and that's when they tell us that it has to work on Amazon Web Services. And if that's not how we built it, we've got some stuff to work out, right? Uh, so features, timeline, budget, tools, availability, vacation is one of those, but there's so many other examples of uh, how much time and energy you have. As I mentioned, I split my time between Polar Notion, doing service work and New Story, which is a global housing nonprofit. My availability is all over the map. Emily can probably attest to that. And that is something that is worth communicating of how much time and when do you get from all of the members of the team. That is also a reason why keeping the headcount or the number of people on a project low is really valuable because if you've got 20 people, the odds of getting everyone in alignment and in the room at the same time, very, very low. And then finally support. What kind of support can um, you expect or they expect Understanding all those before you start to dive into a project or uh, an engagement together uh, can be very helpful. And also just knowing that they exist is, uh, is also valuable. So here's some don'ts. Again, generalizations here, but by and large, uh, these don'ts tend to win out. So don't hand them your solution, right? Hand them a problem. Don't trivialize the request. So one thing that can really start to uh, 
I don't know, I wouldn't say dampen the relationship per se, but if every time a problem comes to me and they're quite, well, hey, okay, I got a really easy thing or this isn't that hard, right? And we're uh, oftentimes on the non-technical side, you're, you're kind of hoping it's not challenging or based on your understanding, maybe it doesn't feel that way. But again, if the goal of a developer is to solve problems, if what they enjoy is solving problems, when you bring them something and call it easy, you've kind of def deflated it uh, quite a bit. Next, don't make assumptions, right? Try to communicate all of the nuance to the key points of the project. And then don't tell them, ask them. This is all about enrollment. And again, this is a great point in relationship. Rather than telling people to do things, more often than not, the best way to get them involved and enthusiastically involved is to ask them, hey, I've got a problem. Do you have 10 minutes for me to tell you about it? Right? At any point, giving them an option, a buy into the conversation uh, can be valuable. And this isn't, uh, it doesn't merely have to be a like team to team thing. This can be a leader thing as well. So you say, well, Morgan, your CTO, come on, you tell people to do stuff all the time. You're right. That does happen. However, I can almost guarantee that the way to get more involvement from them is to ask them more questions, to ask their opinion, to invite them more and more into that conversation. And uh, it is way more successful than merely telling them, hey, I need this done. Here's when I need it. Ready, set, go. All right, so we've got some jargon here. Um, part of why I just dumped all these words on a slide is because we can all just take a minute, look at it, recognize that this is probably only 10% Maybe it's 5%. Uh, the more I learn, the more I was, it's probably like a fraction of all of the words out there. Why I bring up the macchiato first is because every single one of these, uh, maybe not every single one, most of this list has its own form of a macchiato. You could ask 10 people and you'll probably get 11 different definitions, right? So rather than trying to cover a bunch of jargon and definitions here, if you understand that the defining of terms is the valuable part, then whatever words are popping up that you don't understand, that's when I would encourage you to raise your hand and ask for clarification, right? So rather than trying to um, understand an empirical definition of these words, in most cases, they don't exist. And so recognizing the fact that, hey, if, if you find yourself not understanding, or if you hear very jargony words, it could be valuable to take a beat and get on the same page. You don't actually have to agree. It really is just a matter of, um, recognizing that the definitions may vary between the two of you. And if you need them to do something, then more important than agreeing on the word, it's just making sure they understand the spirit or the nature of which uh, you want them to complete something, right? So lots of terms, lots of jargon. Google is kind of helpful here, um, but what Google does not do is tell you what everyone else is thinking that it is. It, it gives you like the Webster's definition of it. And I think nothing illustrates this point actually better than job titles in technology. So when I started in tech, I'm, you know, looking at jobs and technology and I'm like, oh, this is really cool. And I see like junior developer, mid-level developer, senior developer. And I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Senior sounds like the top of the list. That's what I want to do, right? I want to get there. And pretty quickly, I realized there isn't an objective understanding of what a senior developer is. Every company defines it different. And in many cases, uh, if the average tenure today of a software engineer in the Bay Area is 11 months, sometimes the best way to become a senior developer is to change jobs, change jobs every 10 months and ask the next guy for an increase in your title. That's it. And you're like, well, that's very cynical. The reality is most organizations don't have an objective measure of those things. And you're saying it, it, it feels almost unbelievable because when you look at compensation from a junior level to a senior, it's vastly different. And there's, uh, there are very few cases of uh, an objective understanding of, of that gap. It really just comes back to, do you have good negotiating skills? Can you advocate for yourself and your experience? Do you have lots of examples to show people, right? There, it's, it's a very squishy definition of all of those terms. And if those terms map to real money and people's salaries, how much more ambiguity are, are there in all these other, all these other terms? Uh, so uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, dichotomies or tensions in technology, which I've touched on, um, but one of the largest is around strategy and execution, right? So there's a tension here. If you look at the bottom axis as the execution axis and strategy as the, um, as the, the Y axis here, um, 
the execution is very much like we mentioned, like the developer, the person who you give them a list and they'll just pound through a, a task list of things to do. Execution is typically very inexpensive. It's commoditized. And then on the flip side is the strategy. Um, this would be like the, the PhD doctoral student who knows a thing, right? And probably teaches classes somewhere. Um, and then what we like is a nice balance of both. So yes, I want to be a very strategic thinker. I want to process lots of inputs and understand the trade-offs, but I also want to be a practitioner. I never want to separate myself too far from what it actually takes to get the work done. And so there's a nice sweet spot here that um, that's the dotted line of uh, balancing strategy and execution. Uh, again, there's not a, it's not a, a perfect equation, but it can be very helpful to realize first that these two axes exist. And then as you're talking with a developer, realize they probably map themselves at a different point on this continuum than you would, right? Uh, if you are very early stage looking to get product market fit or build an MVP, you're probably looking for more, uh, somebody who has a little bit of strategy, but then can, can move pretty quickly and test things. Uh, and then on the flip side, we've, uh, worked on products that are pretty well matured. And there are many people whose entire job is just fixing bugs that pop up. Very execution oriented. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. They just need to show up and, and punch through tasks, right? Uh, so recognizing that the person you're talking to likely falls somewhere in this mix and your needs probably fall somewhere in this mix. And it would be uh, it's very unlikely that those fall perfectly in line. And so it's worth a conversation to have about the mix and or the value of strategy versus execution. If you find yourself championing for uh, the cheapest hourly rate, uh, a word of caution is you will likely find yourself more and more with somebody who can merely execute, right? Um, and we've seen software that they got a lot of work done really quickly and it was heading in the wrong direction. On the flip side, uh, strategy can often be more expensive, but if that's all you have is strategy, then it's really hard to get a product to market. So this is a question that I love for project managers, but if you're a client who's self-managing something, this can also be great. Or if you're on the developer side and you're thinking, um, you know, kind of evaluating the effort needed to get the work done, are you on track? So are you on track implies that you've defined what on track means, right? So on track for us is we would, uh, if we're going to work in two week sprints, then on track means by the end of the two weeks, I'm going to get done what I said I was going to get done. So it implies a level of, uh, of thought and of planning. And then uh, I also like it because it doesn't really matter why you're not on track. If you're halfway through a two week sprint, so you're one week in, and you're off track, if we're going to talk about why you're off track, we're just losing more time. Are you on track? If no, you have four options for how do we get back on track? So I don't care why you're off track. What I care about is how do we get back on track? And so the first option is simplify. So you can get back on track oftentimes by just simplifying the work to be done, right? The next is help. Getting help, not, don't think of it like, oh, we'll just put two programmers on it. No, help would be from, um, it could be a designer or somebody who can speak to the problem to move it along. The next tends to be, so number three is expertise, which tends to be inside of, um, inside of the, the industry. So if I'm a software engineer, expertise is a more senior or more experienced software engineer, but it could also come in the form of a, a domain expert about the problem I'm trying to solve. So simplify is the easiest one because it, it's literally just saying, hey, yeah, we could do less and get there. The next is bring in somebody who can um, add more perspective or answer some questions. Three is just get a, a better, sharper version of what we need or somebody who can help accelerate learning. And then finally, I deliberately numbered these so that I could put time as number four. Uh, we usually, if something's off track, want to just extend the time, but time starts to create new problems, right? So if you've planned a certain amount of uh, a couple weeks to get something done. If you just keep adding time, it starts to push um, projects. It starts to push learning. Uh, so that is very much a last resort. And if I wanted to clutter up this slide, I would put kind of like a, uh, a dotted line or some type of delineation between one, two, and three and number four. One, two, and three 
um, when you're on a team are almost always possible. And four is always easy, but is, uh, is the most expensive more often than not. So are you on track? Next around estimates. One thing that we like to do before starting a project is ask developers to estimate the complexity, right? So it's not necessarily about estimating time because as humans, we're not very good at estimating time, right? The, the bigger the task, the further out it is, the worse we get. And so we want to estimate the complexity of the problem. And then eventually that starts to create a trend line that can be mapped to time. But the point isn't time, it's complexity. And if we can reduce complexity, then we can often increase the visibility of, uh, of the work to be done. So at the beginning of a project, we'll want to estimate the complexity. And then at the end, we'll want to reflect on what it actually took to get it done. Now, here's a scale. And you're like, Morgan, you left some numbers out, which is true. This is borrowed from Scrum. And it's the golden ratio. So you'll notice that like it goes 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21. Um, this illustrates the idea that the bigger something gets, the more inaccurate we are. So if it's really complex, the difference between 19 and 21, it's like, it doesn't matter, right? It just means that it's big and it's complex. And if it's one, presumably I've done it a lot before and I can see the end. There's an end in sight. Um, so we've, uh, used these numbers. You can break it per task. So I have a task list of 10 things I would go through. I would put my estimated complexity on each. And then as I complete them, I would reflect and say, okay, well, what was it actually? And then being able to compare those two of, oh, I thought it was a five, but it was really a 13. Well, that's helpful information, right? I've underestimated the effort, which will likely impact timeline and other things. Uh, or on the flip side, I could have thought it was a 13 and, oh, that was really a two. Well, awesome. Now we've, we've created some margin in the project. Now, if you go through the work of estimating, and I like these numbers, because uh, then it allows me to go through and say, hey, if it's a double digit number, it's pro there's probably a couple tasks in there. Like that thing that we've asked to do, um, set up credit card, uh, charging customers on a credit card, right? That, that could be a task. Yeah, that's a 13 or 21, because there's just a lot of other things that have to happen in there. Uh, so if it's double digit, I want to break it down. And then in all of the subtasks, now go point them and all of them should be less than double digit. If it's five to eight, expect delays. So if you ask a developer to estimate the complexity and they're giving you a five and an eight, usually I'm like, cool, that's helpful. And I'm not going to get, I'm not going to be surprised if uh, they're, they're a little late there because when an eight becomes a 13, what that means is they need to break it down more. And so that's a visibility problem and can expect delays. Oh, and then one, two, and three are like nice. They should be pretty predictable and pretty expected early on. I've found that um, pretty young engineers tend to underestimate because everything feels a little bit easier. And then what winds up happening at some point is more experienced engineers start to overestimate things because they've been hurt and burned so many times by surprises and things that pop up that uh, they'll often want to overestimate, but there's not really a right answer here, right? It, it's uh, person to person, and it's more about the, um, the track record, or Scrum would call it the velocity. So how do you see it moving over time? That's the most valuable. And forcing yourself or the, uh, at inviting the person you're working with to do actuals and estimates allows you to start to see where are they on that continuum, right? Are they over or under? We covered a lot of information. I realize this is probably like drinking through a fire hose. Um, I would love to hear, we've got about five minutes left. Thoughts, questions, feedback? Yeah, there's one thing I would like you to comment on. Uh, this is Bill Edmondson. Uh, I often find that um, developers, uh, they actually really want to please. And so they will um, uh, unintentionally agree to things that are not, um, in the best interest of them or the team or the project. And then everybody's kind of frustrated at the end because of, because of overcommitment. I'm curious uh, how you combat that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so I'm, I've told my wife that I get home at, I'm going to get home at 6 PM every night. Most nights I'm close, many nights I'm wrong. Uh, and that's because it's not just developers who want to please, it's, it's people, right? Like we don't want to let people down. We don't want to not come through. I think if your team has one developer on it, 
there's, there's a chance that they have a lot of demands on them and they're often having to do things and learn things for the first time. If you've got a very robust team, then much the same way, right? Team members don't want to let each other down. I think what's hard is because uh, like software development in particular, oftentimes there isn't anybody else on the team who has the skills to do it that uh, this is where I like the complexity breakdown is because you're giving them a way of talking about the problem or the task in a form that you can actually understand, right? If somebody says, what's it going to take for you? Like, give me a number of what it's going to take. What is the complexity of this task? And I tell you a 13, right? Oh, it's not some crazy science experiment that I've come up at 13. What I'm saying is like, I mean, like some of it's clear, some of it's not clear. And if you hear a 13, that's a matter of you saying, okay, something about what I'm asking him to do isn't clear enough. And then you can have more of that conversation. So um, yeah, it's less about trying to get a human to stop trying to overpromise. And some with this like actuals and estimates, you're, you're providing a framework of having a conversation to illuminate problems. And there are plenty of uh, like, technology leaders I know that use a similar scale and they'll allow a project to start with 13s and 21s on the page. That's like just a difference in opinion. For me, I'm just seeing that signaling from the developer who gave those points to that task. I'm like, I'm not comfortable starting until we dive deeper, right? Um, and typically the way it manifests in reality, when you start to press deeper and um, kind of challenge some of those, uh, the assessment, it means a little bit more time on a whiteboard. It means a little more time planning. It might also mean um, that the project could be simpler on some level or more clear. So I don't, I don't know that I have an answer to uh, people over promising, but what I found is the idea of estimates and actuals over time, you start to learn people better of like, what is their default position? And like, I'm an optimist for sure, right? I'm like a five or eight person when things are really like a 13. Okay. Uh, now I know that about myself, but it's, I don't think it is reasonable for me to expect uh, a young, less experienced engineer to know that about themselves yet because they just haven't had as many shots on goal or as many, um, as much time to like feel the weight of over promising and under delivering for your team. And then also there's just a lot to know, right? So much to know, not only for non-technical people, but being in the weeds, the older I get, the more I do this, the more I realize, yeah, I've, my, my percentage of understanding is, it feels like it's continually shrinking. So I will, uh, will, is that right? William, how about helpful? Yep. Yeah. Oh, no, that's, that's good. Helpful. I think the, uh, it, that was a great answer. I think, um, going back to an earlier point you made, there's just, um, you know, the, a lot of the terms people used for developers were, you know, cold or disinterested or all these kind of things. And I think there's, there's a lot more care below that than people realize. And sure. it's probably, it's probably a helpful thing to recognize that, that, that these, these, uh, these developers actually care a lot uh, for the thing. Um, they're just not always able to communicate it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. I had a question. Um, I, I have a feeling that maybe I have given my developers a little too much information, <laughs> but I am a problem solver myself. That's why I came up with this idea. And I feel like, you know, I might not be a developer. I've worked for two startups already. I'm usually that person on the sales end that helps the clients, you know, or get the product to where it needs to be for product usage. So I'm kind of getting a feeling now that maybe I've, I've let in too much for developers not to be able to help it or, or, because they don't know my business. And I guess that's like, what is the line of how much information you give for them to solve a problem when they don't know your industry? Mommy. Sorry. So there, there's a little bit of an assumption baked in there that not knowing the industry is bad, where sometimes the ignorance of not knowing an industry actually causes you to do things that are really good. So the founders of Airbnb, for instance, they were not experts in the hotel industry. They were like college kids who wanted friends' couch, couches to surf on when they went to concerts in other cities, right? So they were kind of ignorant to like how hotels work or how hospitality works. But because of that, they actually um, 
they did things that were outside of the lane of what they should have done, but was, they were wildly successful. Now, that's not always the case, but there is value in not knowing the industry because you can bring in outside knowledge and fill that gap. Uh, at the same time, I will say the, that's where there's a sweet spot between the strategy and the execution. So a chief technology officer at its core, again, you could ask 10 people, you get 11 answers. Um, the way I see it is the goal of a more strategic technologist is to align technology with business objectives. So if I'm going to work on a project, I'm going to put in time on the front end to understand a little bit more about the industry. Now, knowing what I know, I'm also looking for what are those uh, like unspoken uh, rules or like the sacred cows of the industry. Because oftentimes, if you can cut a lot of that complexity out, you can build a better product. Uh, so there is, it's kind of a mix of both. I will say though, um, it's a little bit of a misnomer to think if they don't know your industry, uh, you can't trust some of their instincts. It's a little bit of both. And that's where usually the challenge comes in of like finding somebody who does have some business understanding and technical knowledge and willingness and available and can fit within your budget, right? Like these things start adding up pretty big. And so the best solution that, or the best recommendation I would have for teams is just try to do less. Can you validate what you're trying to accomplish with less effort, with less expertise needed? Um, there's usually room to break it down and uh, test smaller assumptions. Uh, let's do two more questions. I've, I've gone a little bit over. If, if you need to jump, I completely understand. Uh, going over tends to be a, a bad habit of mine, but uh, two more questions and then we can jump off. Hey, David. I, I, I can't unmute you. I'm trying to help. I'm I think lost. he was oh, he waved trying. goodbye. He, he waved goodbye. goodbye. He it. did say thank you for providing this forum. Thank you, Morgan. Yeah, my pleasure. Awesome. Um, one thing I'll I'll drop this in the channel. And Emily, if you have the uh, feedback link, I'm not sure if you have that at your fingertips, but I'm gonna drop my email in. If questions pop up, please do reach out. Uh, again, that is my email. I respond, try to clean my inbox uh, every 24 hours or so. Uh, so I love questions. I love hearing about your journey, where you are. Uh, one thing that I'll try and do wherever possible is actually not prescribe too much of anything, but just share from experience some things that I've seen and walk through in hopes that you'll hear something that you can find valuable in that. Um, but I appreciate your time. And I'll share the email and the video with everyone either this afternoon or Monday whenever I can get the video downloaded. Uh, and so, yeah, I'll be following up. Hey Chandler, can you stick around? Yeah, Chandler. sure. I don't know if it closes, but. I do think, Dan, the Zoom is gonna close, but yeah, Chandler like is chance. now part of the EC Slack channel. Boom, boom, boom. So. Yeah, feel free to shoot me a call, Dan. All right, everyone, thank you. Morgan, thanks. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone.